Okay, sorry everyone. The uh, my power source cut off, so uh, my my battery was dying. So okay, we're back in business. Federalism. Why in the world are states not allowed to declare war? Well, because we had the Civil War, and also because we don't want California invading, you know, Mexico or Minnesota invading Canada or something like that, right? So second on our list here, where what federal powers, exclusively federal. Um, exist in the Constitution. The second one, you could put in any particular order on the test, by the way, or in your notes. The order is not important. Um, the second thing that only the federal government can do is to trade with other countries. States cannot do that without doing it through the United States government. States can, o states can only do it with each other. So who's in control of international trade? The federal government. So that's a huge one, right? So war, international trade, and then there's a, a second type of trade they're in charge of. Any trade between states, okay? So when you think trade, just think this, you're buying something, okay? So now let me give you an example because this is going to be interesting with um, – the difference between certain things being allowed across state lines and other things not. So let's say you went for some strange reason, you drove to Arizona to buy a pair of, you know, Air Jordans, right? And you drove back and you came over the state line. Would there be any legal worry that you had as you were crossing a state line with those shoes? Zero. It doesn't make any sense, right? But wait a minute. What if you were doing it with marijuana in your car now this is a really important question federalism says that the federal government wins right over the states but wait a minute the federal government has already said marijuana is illegal so this is the current federal government rule on marijuana they it's classified I'm not saying I agree with this, but this is what the federal government says on marijuana. It says it's a Schedule One narcotic, which means it's in the highest classification in the most dangerous and addicting drugs known to Americans, known to America. So it's a, a, cl a cl class one, the highest, most dangerous classification it's given. And what that means is that under that classification, Schedule One, no state is allowed to legalize marijuana. No state. Now, this might start to sound confusing. If you're listening carefully, this is confusing. You're telling me, Professor V, the federal government specifically says that no state can have legalized marijuana. But yet, California has it and so many other states now, right? It's just a growing list. Here's why and how that could possibly happen. Is it possible that sometimes the grandparents don't want to enforce the rules on their their children or the, the parents don't want? So I'll give you an example, right? Well, just break it down like this. Would President Obama, would President Trump become more popular, win more votes in the next election if they had done, or if they, if Trump did, go in, tell the drug enforcement agency to raid every single marijuana dispensary in Long Beach and all over the country. Could, first of all, could Obama have done that? Could Obama have said, go right now, I'm sending federal, you know, forces in to go raid and take away every marijuana because it's technically illegal? He could have done that. Yes, he could have. He could have. So you're like, ah, I thought it was legal. But here's, if, if, you're, if you're on the legality side, here's the good news. There's no motivation for Trump or Obama to do that to the states. Why not? Because most people in most states aren't going to be happy if the president just starts raiding, you know, peaceful businesses in their community, Right. Especially in 2020 where, you know, when I'm driving to work at Long Beach, you'll see, of course, you'll see alcohol signs. It's always been there, you know, but in that, then you see advertisements for marijuana, right? So now going back to that question, 
why if, if Trump or Obama or and all these presidents since it's been classified as Schedule One since Nixon, why haven't they rated? And sometimes they have to, to lesser 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 degrees, um, but there there have been raids. Um, why don't they do that? Why don't they enforce the law? And the answer is because that law is not popular. It's this is I think it's as uh, almost unequivocal statement here. In other words, I'm. There's almost no doubt that this is the case, that Americans disagree with the classification of marijuana in the highest and most dangerous category with heroin. The problem is most Americans don't know it's in that classification. What they disagree with is that it's illegal. So they don't know why, right? And so this is the weird thing about federalism, is that sometimes it is illegal under the, the federal law, but they just don't enforce it. Does that make sense? So it'd be like the, the speed limit's 55, but everyone knows the police officers let you go 75, right? Or you go to drive on the Autobahn and there's no speed limit at all, right? So does, that, does this make sense? So the federal government can enforce whatever laws they want to enforce. I'll give you the best example that I can think of off top of my head in American history of when federal forces did a great, great thing for our country. Um, and that is the, if you all know this case, the case of Brown versus Board of Education in 1952. Um, there were like sister cases, but the case, the cases ba basically said this, that separate but equal is not equal. Having white and black people in different schools is not fair, it's not equal, and it's not constitutional, right? So, thank goodness they ruled that, finally. So, but here's the problem. You've got a racist governor in the South that says, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. He's that racist that he, that you, some of you may know this story where he, the, imagine this, the governor, it's, it's sickening that there's actual history, but we have to acknowledge it. The governor of a state was that racist where he stood in front of the high school, maybe, it may have even been a middle school, whatever school it was, these kids were K through 12 age, right? They're just trying to go to school. And the, the Supreme Court has said, these separate but equal are not equal. So come together, and the word is integrate. And they said to do it with, and I love this, with all deliberate speed. I'm putting in quotations because actually that's exactly all deliberate speed. I love that because that's that seems really clear to me. They're saying do what? They're saying integrate, get black and white people together right now. Enough is enough. No more segregation. No more dis. Um, disenfranchisement, no more inequality, no more different places on the bus, no more different water fountains, no more different schools, right? But the governor is so racist that he says, I'm not going to let these children come in. And so here's the good ending to the story, because that's just disgustingly racist, right? President Eisenhower says, I, I mean, he has a choice to make, right? Do, do I let the governor of the, the, this governor is so racist. Do I let him just keep these African-American children out of the school? Or do I enforce what the Supreme Court said? Because the Supreme Court's nine judges. They're, they don't have guns, they, badges. I mean, they might have privately on their own, but they don't, they're, they can't enforce anything, right? That's not their job. Their job is to, t is to say whether that law that they're looking at is constitutional. And the law they were looking at was, you know, segregation. And they said it's not constitutional. So President Eisenhower, some people called him Ike, I-K-E, I think. I like Ike was like his icon or his campaign slogan. Um, he sent troops in. He ordered troops to go in and escort people into the school that they already should have been allowed into. Um, and so that just shows you the difference, right? There's no app. Just think about this. There's no appetite for m m most Americans. Uh, this polls will show you about 70. It's almost three out of four Americans 
think marijuana should be legal or at least decriminalized, which means don't go to jail for it. So there's Trump or Obama or whoever isn't going to win popularity by doing that. So they just probably won't do it. Right. They just they're just not going to. And eventually the law, I mean, looking at the trajectory of, of where the country is going, eventually the federal law will be changed depending on who's president you know, next, it, it may be faster or slower, but um, there are even Republicans who, so does that, that gives you a picture of how federalism works. It, this, the federal government, if they want to, they could crack down hard and just enforce it all and throw all the marijuana, you know, users and, and um, medical or otherwise, and all the people who own the places and made the products, throw them all in federal prison. But is that like is that gonna win you brownie points as as the president, right? Is anyone gonna be like, oh, that was really great. The president did that, you know, not 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 in twenty twenty, and so that's why it doesn't happen, right? Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, so enforcing the law is up to the federal government, and sometimes they just, you know, in the tenth amendment says when they don't have a law at all, like before there was a ruling about gay marriage by the Supreme Court, states got to do what they wanted. And so some people who are against gay marriage just said, well, if you don't like it, just move to a different state where it is legal. And they were saying, well, that's what federalism is, right? Although people on the other side are going to say, come on, you're going to deny people in certain states the right to, to get married to who they love. Um, so I hope this is making sense. Super, super intense stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's amazing how much... There can be in, in terms of a clash, especially when you look at Brown versus Board of Education and segregation was supposed to become integration. The governor doesn't want it. And so the president, the federal government has to say, you're taking it. You're taking black students into a white school and you're taking the Supreme Court's ruling and you're going to live it out because that's the right thing to do. Right. And that's the law of the land. So. That's a great Supreme Court case. Um, okay, so federalism, I think we've maybe finished out our list here. Let's give one or two more things to the list of the federal government, what they can do, okay? So the federal government also um, can exclusively can go to war, or we said go to war. Um, they, sorry, they can exclusively print, mon print money. Um, and you can actually say mint money. The federal government is in charge of actually making money physically making it right like a coin a dollar bill they're in charge of making it think and this is probably the easiest question you'll get all semester think about why wouldn't the constitution have thought well let's just give states the power to make their own money because imagine what that would look like in today's economy right so you want to go to vegas this weekend and you know you got to go change oh do you have any nevada dollars do you have any arizona dollars right it, it would be it would be a disaster to, to the economy, right? So we have to have one currency in that regard, and that's where the federal government gets to print the money. Um, does that make sense? Hopefully. Um, you could add one more thing. I know we're going past four things now for the federal government, but international treaties, entering into treaties with other countries, states can't do it. They, I mean, they can do it, but it, it isn't legitimate under the Constitution. Um, okay, now, made it through the first list. Awesome. Second list. First list was federal government powers, rights that are just theirs and only theirs. Now we come to states' rights, okay? So I think we're back now down to states, okay? Sorry about my if my hand motions are confusing. I'm, um, so states have some really important powers, and we'll start with the most important one, if you are a Trump supporter, you love this. If you are a Hillary Clinton supporter, you hate this. But elections are done on the state level, right? So that's the first thing we could say here on the state level, elections. There, that is the state's power completely. So what does that mean? That means who makes it on the ballot, what the parameters are for getting on the ballot, which for Republicans and Democrats is not going to honestly going to be a problem. But for smaller parties like Green Party and Libertarian Party, independent others, it's going to be very hard to get on the ballot. So first of all, states can set, but they can also allot the electoral votes however they want. Now, we'll learn this later, but if you know 
about electoral votes, you know that 48 out of the 50 states in our country, besides Nebraska and Maine, for 96% of the states in our country, when a candidate wins one more vote than someone in a state, the stake is all of the electoral votes to the winner. So in other words, if you if if Hillary Clinton won, you know, one million votes in a given state and Trump won one million and one. Now let's say if the state was California, you would say, Oh, well, that's a really close race. What would happen to the electoral votes, the fifty-five, let's say, for California? What would become of that? Because Trump only won by one vote. It was one million to one million and one, right? Here's what happens. Trump gets 55, Hillary Clinton gets zero. Now, in the other case, Hillary Clinton in Texas, say, wins by one vote. This, these are not realistic at all because <laughs> these candidates would never win in these states. But d d is this making sense? I hope I hope so. Okay, if not, email me, post a question. Um, but let's get back to it. Okay, so elections, I hope that makes sense. I, be I believe it, it should because you can see it's not a conspiracy or anything crazy. The whole world discovered that, oh, yeah, you can win an election by roughly 3 million votes and not become the president. And that's because states control the elections. And that's the Electoral College. Okay, so what else can we get on states? We did federals out of the way. State here. Let's keep going with states. Here's another thing that states can do. This is huge. They can ratify amendments to the Constitution. Remember, we were talking about amendments just now, right? And uh, oh, previously, 30 minutes ago or so, the states are the ones that get to add a new amendment. So, for example, let's say in 1920, when, which is crazy to think it took that long, and crazy to think that Brown versus Board was only 1952, it wasn't so much sooner. But in 1920, the 19th Amendment got ratified, which basically means this. Ratified means it became the constitutional law. It, it, they, it's now in the Constitution. It wasn't there before, and now it's a permanent place in the Constitution, unless, of course, it's removed like drinking prohibition was. Okay, But for women to be able to get to right, the right to vote in 1920, you have to have – so this is what you can write in your notes. States have elections, and then states have this power. Change the Constitution, but they, here's the catch. You need three-fourths of states to do it. You need 75% of the states in the country to do it which you need 38 out of 50, at least, in today's 50 states, okay? So that is doable, but it's hard, right? It's it's not going to happen every day where 75% of states even agree that the sky is blue or that grass is green, right? I mean, I'm not even necessarily joking. Think think about that as, as the only real big obstacle, but it is a big one. But still, it, it can happen. States can change the Constitution, okay? So that's the second thing. Third thing that states can do, they can decide laws to trade within their own state. And that may not sound like a big thing, but it's 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 fairly big. If you if you go back to the idea of marijuana businesses, the federal government's basically leaving it alone, right? So within California, intrastate, remember I was saying, you know, if you drive from one state to another with Air Jordans, nobody cares. There's not there's no federal crime being broken. But if you drive across a, a state boundary with marijuana, you just broke a federal law. So the, wait a minute. What is this? That This means that that's the federal power. If you go from state to state, they can, they can enforce it. But within your state, that's intrastate trade. So I-N-T-R-A, intrastate trade is trade within your own state, and that's – that's what we're we would rather probably be used to in California. In other words, please don't do this. But you you could drive. Well, it's none of my business. But you you can drive in California with marijuana in your car, like you could with alcohol in the back, in the trunk or something, right? And there's there's no way. This is interesting now for federalism. There's no legal way for a California officer to get you in trouble for having that marijuana in your car, assuming you're of age. Why? Because California law says it's okay. Federal law says it's not okay. Does that make sense? So intrastate trade, that's another uh, right of the states. Um, okay, so 
we're going to move to shared powers. Okay, so shared is obviously what we're going to say is that the federal government can do it and the states can do it. Okay. Um, and you know what? I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to reverse really quick. I want to add one more thing to this list because I think we only got to three. Police power. Forgive me. We're almost, we're almost there. Police power is a state's right. State right. So going back to that example, okay? So if, if let's do a new example. If you're driving, talking on your cell phone in Arizona, which I don't know if it's legal, but let's just say it's legal for the, the point here. I'm talking on my cell phone on the way to California, okay? Calif when I get into California, can a cop from another state come and tell me that I can't be on my cell phone? No, a California police officer would enforce that, right? And so I guess what I'm saying in this part is that states have their own jurisdiction. This is the first time on this semester I've used this word in class, but I think some of you would, would know it already. If not, that's okay. Jurisdiction is a legal word, a uh, legal term that essentially means your sphere of power. Where, where, where's your uh, power? Does it, are you, are you all powerful? Can you go anywhere in the country and enforce any law? No, police can't do that. Police can only enforce the laws in their state. Okay. So, um, okay. Hopefully that that's helpful. That gets you to, you know, the next thing, which is the shared, the shared power. So we have federal power, state power, and now powers they share. So number one, healthcare, right? Healthcare, you may disagree or agree with uh, with what is called Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, but there's no doubt that there is coordination between the federal government and state government on healthcare. There has to be, right? Second, education. So the federal government has something to say about education, but so do the states. And and state member states includes localities. So. The state and locality has a lot to say in education, and the federal government has a fair bit to say through the Department of Education and the funding that they might give and the instructions they might, uh, the regulations they might put forward. I mean, in regulations, a fancy word for a law or a rule. So, um, okay, so th that's the second one, education. So we have healthcare, education, and then going down, trade. Because everyone can trade states, cities, and federal government, but depending on where you are in that, it that will determine who you can trade with. In other words, the federal government can trade with other countries, states can trade with other states, and so can municipalities and localities, okay? Um, meaning local cities and counties. Um, and then here's a dangerous one that they that all got levels of government share. It's borrowing money. This one's dangerous to me because, well, it, right now it's not as important as the national conversation we're having over racial killing. It, it's a, I understand that a hundred percent, and I don't. I would never even equate it, but it's separate from this most important issue of the time right now. The debt is like a really big, like a, a separate problem that that needs to be addressed. It's not as it's not as um, dire. It's not killing people. Um, and so I just want to be clear where I stand on, on that. Um, but, I, but, but I hope that makes sense, right? So, man, you've got so many powers, Professor E, that you just listed. Yes, yeah, so federal government, state government, local government. The one we were just concluding with is I'd say it's a dangerous power, which is the right to to borrow money and the ability to borrow money. And the reason I say that it's, it's, it's an, I'd say it's an insidious threat. Whereas the threat we're talking about now nationally is, 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 is a physical violent, right? Um, the threat with the debt isn't that it's not as severe. So, but, it, but it, here's the problem. The United States is at the beginning of this course, or see, I say beginning of the spring course, it was about $23 trillion. 
the coronavirus came, the debt is skyrocketing now. So why do I say this is, is a dangerous thing? Because it's not something that we're able to focus on right now as a country. So it'll just continue to grow. Um, and why does that matter? Who cares if we have debt? Honestly, who cares? Well, the reason it can be dangerous is because at some point, at some point, and if you asked me my my professional opinion, political science wise, I would say, you know, a long, many, many, many decades. But let's just say in 50 years or some, so something, China and other countries that have lent us money say we want our money back and we don't have the ability to pay. Well, we would default and then we'd never be able to probably borrow money from anyone else again. And there would be what's called leverage. In other words, whoever owns your debt owns kind of owns you in a way, right? Like it, if they decide something, um, and I'll give you an example. Okay. So the United States wanted England not to get in a war in the 1950s. Um, and England and France were both like going to fight over this small piece of land. Okay. And I, I don't want to get caught in the details. Just, just check this one part. The United States really didn't want them to go to war because it had already been World War II and it had been settled and like the U.S. wasn't going to go fight England and France because they're like our allies. We weren't going to fight them to stop going to prevent them from going to war. So what did the U.S. do? The U.S. said this, we've lent you a lot of money, Great Britain. If you want to go do this war that we're telling you not to, pay up all the money that you owe us right now. So what did England do? Well, we're going home. Go spend some more time with my family, right? They packed up so quick and went home. Why? Because it would have it would have destroyed their economy. England's economy would have been destroyed if the U.S. at that time demanded them to pay all the money that at that point they didn't have, right? And so... Putting that into context, if at some point in the future, another country tells us not to do something and we're like, well, China's not going to go to war with us. They're not going to stop us that way. There could be financial warfare. Does that make sense? And so something to think about later this semester, we'll, uh, I'll show you all uh, and you can, you can watch it now if you want. Um, it's called IOUSA. The original one was made in like 2007. Um, like right before Obama, 2008, right before Obama became president. Um, but there have been a lot of updates to it. And it, it just gives a really interesting, quick, brief, you can watch 30-minute version of it, IOUSA, uh, a version of why the U.S. is in such debt and, and what we could do to get out of it. So anyway, I hope this federalism lecture has made sense. So remember, federalism, and it's a long conclusion. You, you all have done great. Thank you for putting up with us. A little bit extra extra long lecture today. Um, but remember this. Federalism is the idea that federal, state, and local each have their own power. Um, federal is going to have certain powers. State is going to have certain powers. And then there's going to be certain powers that they share. The federal government doesn't always enforce the laws. Um, but they will when it's popular to. Right? Or in the case of, um, you know, Eisenhower with, African-American and, and Caucasian integration, the president can make the right thing happen right away if if the appetite is there to do, the in this case, the right thing, right? So, okay, I'll sign off for now. I've, I feel like I've overloaded you. I hope I haven't. If I have, send me an email. Be nice, be merciful. But let me know if I went, any, went over anything too fast, if it didn't make sense. Or um, if just you have like questions you, you don't want to post publicly. Otherwise, um, once you once you're done and once you're hearing me say this, go on and post something about what you think. Because I'd really love to hear and your, your classmates are going to love to hear as well. Um, everything that you all have commented so far has been really uh, thoughtful. So keep it up until next time, which won't be too long. Professor V.